What I want to do now is I want to talk about Bob. What about Bob? And I want to talk about how moments like these, you know, these, these big changes, life and death and loss and love, don't just change the things around us. Don't just change the circumstances, but they can change us too. If we allow, if we're aware, if we let what's happening really sink in, if we are willing to be present to what is happening, even if it's painful, this is where moments like these can absolutely change us, move us forward on our paths. Now, Bob was a great friend of mine, and he was kind of an institution in a picture here, you know, Scottish Bob, Scottish Bob, you know, everybody, if, I, if they didn't know who Bob was, I'd just say Scottish Bob, oh, okay, I know him, you know, and Anne, of course, and, and they've been here for, I don't know, seven, eight years, I think it's been, and they've just become an institution here and just such a big part of our, of our culture, our community, and our lives. Bob came to us as a connection through AA. He was a great, big in AA leadership, nationwide leadership. And uh, through one of the local meetings here that was here at The Effect, he heard about the church, and he showed up and, and started coming. And he actually sought me out. I always remember that. You know, he came up to me on a Sunday and, and said that he wanted to get together and he wanted to talk and he had things he wanted to talk about. And so we got together for lunch. And he came loaded for bear. Let me tell you, you know, he was in the midst of a huge reconstruction, I should say deconstruction, uh, of his faith, uh, of his theological thought and everything that was going on at the time. And he came with a thousand questions. And we would talk and the, the time would just evaporate. And it was week after week that we would get together and he'd come with all these questions and we'd talk. I heard about all his childhood growing up, the church that he grew up in. I heard about this great story where he woke up and, and uh, the family wasn't around. He thought they'd all been raptured and he was left behind. And, you know, just great stories. The richness of life from Scotland and then coming forward here to America. I mean, all that was present in our discussions. But then over time, it was really interesting to watch. Because as he got more settled, as he went through his process, as he became convinced of what he was convinced of, as his questions were answered to his satisfaction and he felt comfortable moving forward, the questions were less and less until they just sort of tapered off. And then when we got together, we were just friends, just talking, talking about life and talking about what was going on. There were occasional times when things would come back up again, but it was really just a, cha a sea change in the, our relationship with each other. Because it wasn't any more mentor-mentee, it was just two men talking. And we recognized our friendship, we recognized what we had with each other. I remember three years ago, gosh, I can't believe it's only been three years ago. Well, it'll be, I guess it'll be four years ago next spring. But when the pandemic had just started around February, March of 2020, Bob had a trip to Japan planned, a trip to Japan, right? Now, the pandemic starts, and everybody is saying, well, of course you're not going to Japan now, right? No, I'm going to Japan. I can't say it in a Scottish accent, but he's going to Japan, right? And he had a friend that was going with us, and he went anyway. And he had a great time. He said he loved it because nobody was there. Everybody was home, locked behind their closed doors, and he didn't have lines anywhere he went, and they had the run of the place, and it was so quiet, and it was so peaceful. But see, this is the Bob that I knew, this gregarious man, this, this kind of fearless guy who could just go in the face of a pandemic, and that wasn't going to ruin his plans. And then the notice of cancer came in. And I remember um, getting a call one night that he needed a ride to the hospital and needed to go to emergency, and this was still right in the middle of the height of COVID. And so I went, picked him up, and we headed on down to Saddleback, and it was the first time that Bob was no longer coherent. I, I, he couldn't form sentences. He couldn't put things together. And, uh, and of course, that was disturbing. But I figured, OK, it's just a part of it, what's going on. We get to the hospital. And of course, it's like a military installation. Do you all remember that? You know, they had the tables up. They had the uniform guards. They had all the, the hospital uh, personnel in their full-on 
PPE, and I couldn't even get out of the car and walk across the, the sidewalk to the door. I had to stay at the car and just say goodbye to him. I couldn't walk him in. And it just, it, it, I felt so helpless at that point. But he seemed okay, and of course they took him and, and, they, uh, and they checked him in, and then I just had to leave. But I always remember, you know, how unsettling that was to just kind of drop him off and, and leave him there. And then there was a series of surgeries that he went through, but he seemed to be coming back from each one of them. And it was amazing to see his resilience as he kept coming back. But I did notice that his processing was slower with each one of these events. Now, if you know Bob at all, if you've had conversations with Bob, you know that Bob has his own kind of cadence, right? Just long pauses between thoughts. And I remember when I first started to talk to him, you know, those pauses were kind of uncomfortable. And I'm wondering, okay, do I jump in here? Do I try to supply the word that maybe he's looking for? You know how that goes. And I just realized, no, that's just the way he thinks and the way he speaks. And so I just got comfortable with it and just waiting. It really helped me to not be so A-type, you know, about conversations. I was just able to lay back and let him speak, and he would get to it. He would get to it. But I noticed that after the surgeries and as time went on, those pauses got longer and longer, and sometimes he couldn't come back to the thought. And so I saw the changes that were going on with him. There is something called ambiguous loss, and I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it's something that caregivers, especially of Alzheimer's or dementia patients, really suffer with. But it can happen just over a protracted illness, as Bob had. The thing is, is that the person is still there physically, but they're not really there anymore as you knew them. They're not there in the same way that their relations, the relationship you had is remembered. And so there's a, there's a, a loss there. There's a grieving over what was. And it never gets resolved because you just keep experiencing more and more loss as you go, as the person declines. And it's something to really be aware of, the effects of this. If someone dies suddenly, you grieve, you know, and you accommodate the loss and you work through it. But in a situation like this, it's ambiguous. You're not even processing it as a loss cognitively yet until over time. But I know so many of us are caregivers in these circumstances, and so it's good to know about that, know the effects of it, and know what you're dealing with, because it can make it easier then to be able to understand how do you continue to give care under these circumstances. And that's where I was, and of course, where Fiona and Anne were with Bob in terms of this. Fiona told me that basically she lost her dad a year ago. You know, The father that she knew, the one that she had had grown up with and knew all her life and loved, um, was gone a year ago. Yet, I've watched her and I've watched Anne be absolutely steadfast in their care for Bob, especially over these last few weeks and months. And of course, the fact that Fiona is here from Canada anyway, you know, I don't think any man could ask for a better daughter and a better wife in terms of the way that they were around Bob at the bedside you know, these last few weeks and right up to the end. As I said, it's been inspirational for me to see that. As you're going through something like this, there's the moment that you realize that the person is not coming back from this again. You just sort of know. And I was a bit slow on the uptake. Fiona was much quicker, you know. She was very open about it. You know, my dad is dying. And even when she said it to me the first time, I thought, no, no, maybe not. You know, it, it took me a while. And I think it was probably just because I didn't want to. I didn't want to think along those lines. But there is the moment that you realize that. And then it happens. And then there's the other emotions that come in after that. Whenever anyone that I love, anyone that I know passes, the first thing that I'm thinking about is, where are they now? Do you think about that? Where is Bob now? What is Bob doing now? You know, we like to say he's dancing. Whatever limitations he had physically, whatever limitations he had in any other way as a, as a human being, if those are lifted, what is he doing now? What, what is he capable of? Who is he talking to? You know, what's going on? Is he, is he dancing? Is he wheeling over galaxies? I mean, I can, my imagination can go all over the place. You know? And 
all the questions that I have and all the questions that I've always had that remain unanswered. Does Bob have the answers now? Does Bob know what's going on in that, in that particular way? All the age-old human wondering, is that resolved now for Bob? Now, as Christians, we're pretty steeped in heaven and hell and the concepts of the afterlife that we have been taught theologically and doctrinally in every other way. These images are so deeply implanted in us that we basically just take them for granted. They're just sort of knee-jerk responses. When we think of afterlife, these images just download, and then there we are thinking in this particular way, totally ingrained. But have you really thought it through? Have you thought through what an afterlife would really be? Have you considered this? Because, see, it's at moments like these that we are brought into maybe a deeper awareness. Maybe age has something to do with it too. Age has a way of bringing you into deeper awareness. Moments like these and whatever combination of events can undistract us. When we're distracted, just all the need jerk concepts just fall into place from childhood and we just think along those lines. But when something like this happens, we can get undistracted and we can start to think deeper and maybe think through and if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night with uh, chest pains and tightness that's running down your left arm, that undistracts you for sure. That just brings everything right here, right to a focus. You know, What is it we're looking at when we look at the threshold of death? What is it we're really dealing with here? And what do we really know? What do we really know about the afterlife? What does scripture tell us? Well, it tells us a lot of things, but it's in metaphor and it's in figurative speaking and it's, it's imagery that's pulled from the ancient world, kings and thrones. Is that really the way it is? Is that the way it would be for a modern person moving into that sort of experience? How can we know these things? We've had people that have come back from near-death experiences and they tell us all that they tell us. And if they're Christian, they use Christian iconography and Christian imagery to describe what they've seen. And if they're not, they use something else. But one thing that they always bring back is a sense of just being enveloped in love, enveloped in caring. I have a friend who was a, raised a Christian, but he was also a scientist. He was a psychologist, a PhD. And he came back from a near-death experience due to cancer. And his experience was different than the ones that I'd seen before because there was absolutely no imagery at all. What he saw was complete blackness, and that sounds terrifying, but he said there was no fear in the blackness. There was, again, that sense of just love and caring and being cared for. And he kept using the phrase, I was meant to know that, and I love that because it wasn't as if it was a rational voice a voice speaking in words. He was simply meant to know that in some way there was communication that was nonverbal, non-rational. And he was meant to know that he had a choice. He could go forward or he could go back. And the instant that he decided to go back, all the sights and sounds of the crash room were, were back in his awareness again. But that universal experience of just absolute love, belonging, cared forness seems to be present in all of these experiences. So is that proof? Is that proof that we know what the afterlife is all about? See, the problem here is that we can't prove anything that stands outside of the laws of physics as we know them. We can't prove anything that stands outside of rational thought, that stands outside of this time-space continuum in which we've been placed. So in life, in human life, there is no certainty. We don't know things with certainty that stand in the spiritual realm. But we can become convinced of what we know. And the conviction can be more powerful and more important than the certainty. The certainty is merely mind deep. It's just rational. The conviction goes all the way to the floor. The conviction takes us heartfelt and through our experience into a new place. It's up to us to choose what we are convinced of based on everything that we've experienced, based on everything that we've learned, based on everything that we can possibly know. 
It's up to us to choose what we are convinced of, to choose what we believe. That doesn't mean there is no absolute belief out there, but it's up to us to choose how we're going to react to that. Not as a certainty, because it can't be that, but as a basis for how we choose to live, how we choose to conduct our lives, the attitude with which we have for our lives now, right now, today, not later, but now. Because all we have is now. That's it. This one moment we're sharing right now, it's all we have. And it's all Bob has. All Bob has is now as well, wherever he is, whatever he's doing. And I believe that it's the same now. I'm convinced it's the same now. The now we're having is the now that Bob is having. There is only one moment eternally, one presence always in that moment, possibly different, differently experienced. Yeah, possibly, maybe. And then again, maybe not as much as we think. Maybe what Bob is experiencing is still an eternal becoming, a falling further forward and further deeper into God, just as we are doing here, if we so choose. We need convictions about things that we can't know, not about those things themselves or about when they will occur, but about now. It's all about now and the quality of our now that we can create because of our convictions. Now, I've often said, to some of you at least, that if you could prove to me beyond a shadow of a, a doubt that God does not exist, if you could prove to me empirically that death is the end of human experience, I still wouldn't change a thing that I'm doing right now or the way that I'm living right now because this is the best that I've ever been, the most connected I've been, the most peaceful I've ever been. This is what our convictions can do for us. Even though we can't prove them to another person, they can change the quality of now and change the choices that we make. To my socks, I believe that Jesus, this is what Jesus is trying to embed in us, is the experience of a love so great that it changes what we're convinced of. And it completely alters the way that we experience life, the attitude that we have toward it, and the choices that we make. It changes how we live and what we live for and what we choose from. If we begin to believe in and become convinced of love, the oneness that is love, that everything comes from love and everything is returning to love. From that oneness, all this diversity has come and it's returning to that same oneness, that same love. That changes things. And if we're living for and we're choosing from love, from that connection, that allows us to feel the eternal quality of this love. And when we do that, we can become convinced that love is never lost. It only changes form. We're made of love. The God that, lo the God that loves the way Jesus says that God loves literally created us out of that love that energy, and that is never lost. And if you want to even take it into physics, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy is never lost. There's a conservation of energy. The total amount of energy in a closed system, the universe is a closed system, is constant. It's only changing form back and forth. Now, does that law of conservation apply now to non-physical things? Does it apply to spiritual things? I kind of think so. Yesterday, Fiona told me that she still felt her dad's presence. And she said that she's always going to feel her dad's presence, she believes. Is that just a pleasant thought? Something that is comforting for us to think? I think it's more than that. You know, there's a school of thought that believes that everything is occurring all at the same time and all together. Have you ever heard of multiplexing? Multiplexing is having multiple conversations, let's say, along a single pair of copper wires on the telephone. 
So you can have all sorts of different conversations at different frequencies or multiplex in different ways so that you can use the same pair of wires or the same fiber optic for all these different conversations all happening at the same time. This school of thought believes that all dimensions are all happening at the same time in the same space. We're here together with everything else that is. But we don't see it because we're tuned to our frequency and not to their frequencies. Is that true? I have no idea <laughs> if it's true. But what I do believe, at least metaphorically, is that our presence is like this. That we can be present and we can be aware or not. We can occupy the same space with others and be aware of that connection or not. It's up to us. We can multiplex with our presence and actually be aware that we're occupying the space altogether, that we're traveling down that same pair of wires together. Our presence allows us to do it. It's up to us to be aware of the others that are here physically, but I think not, maybe non-physically too. I think what Fiona was feeling was a tuned inness that she had at that moment. Is she going to have it tomorrow, the next day? That's going to be up to Fiona. But I believe that it's possible. There is so much around us and with us all the time multiplexing the space that we're in. How much are we really aware of? How much are you aware of just going through your day-to-day -day lives, of what's really going around you, of what's being said, what's being done, who's there? Yes, Bob is physically gone now. He's unseen. Why God is unseen? We believe that God's presence is still here. Is Bob's presence still here? What do you think the resurrection of Jesus was all about? It was the moment when his followers became aware that he was still present. He was still alive. He was not dead. He was not in the ground. He was not somewhere else. He was here and he was now. He was not lost. He simply changed form. That's the miracle of it. That Jesus was just as present and alive then as he is now. If we become aware, if we allow ourselves to move into that space and it changes us, I received a vivid metaphor of all of this and the nature of present, presence when, uh, gosh, it was years ago now that I took a group of students when I was teaching to Death Valley. And we arrived there at night. And the first thing that I wanted to do was go out into a sand dune field that I had pre-identified that wasn't too far from the, the place we were staying because I wanted to see a really dark sky. I wanted to see the stars the way I hadn't seen them in ages here in the city. I want to read just a little bit from one of my books on, on this particular experience. I called it Stars Beneath Our Feet. All right? Road trip. Death Valley in February. One of the hottest and driest spots in the world, but arriving late at night around 11 at the tail end of winter, temperatures were only in the high 70s with no moon and a dark sky. A large dune field lay just a few miles outside the little town, and I really wanted to see the stars. Though no one lobbies or fights to protect them as they do tigers and rare tadpoles, stars are an endangered species too, at least in the city. So I drove out to the dunes and then walked out several hundred yards, sliding on the slip faces and watching for anything poisonous in the small circle the flashlight threw in the sand. I walked until the world was nothing but dunes and sky and the faint outline of ragged black mountains circling at a respectful distance. Sat down, turned out my light, and looked up. Cold sand, fine like talcum, warm air, waiting for eyes to adjust. In the city, it gets hard to remember what the night sky really looks like, what it's supposed to look like, what it looked like every night to our ancestors before the lights on the ground pushed back against the lights in the sky and prevailed partial constellations limping westward like multiple amputees. It's good to be reminded, to sit under a sky that you forgot existed, that takes your breath away with sheer magnitude and number, 
to see the hazy band of the plane of the galaxy itself angling through a star field so dense that you can only feel inconsequential in response. Watching the whole living sheet turning, all those specks above burning down on all the specks beneath. A few actually burning back, like me, that night, making my pilgrimage deep into the Mojave to find the stars. And there, on my dune of choice, feeling closer to them. Why? Because I could see them? I suppose so. But the stars are all around me right now. I don't have to wait for nightfall or go somewhere remote with really dark sky to be in their presence. They didn't go anywhere at sunrise this morning. They were still there burning away right where they were when the nearby star climbed into view, scattering its light through the air and turning black to gold and gold to light blue. Curtain down. The stars are all right there. And not just above my head. There are stars beneath my feet. It's just that this ball I'm standing on is in the way. Remove the ball, float freely in space, and see stars in every possible direction, equal density and distribution. There is no up or down or right or left or forward or back, just stars everywhere I look, disorienting, disturbing. What is it I really stand on if there are stars beneath my feet. See, at night and right now, think about it. Look down. There's stars beneath your feet. You can't see them because there's 8,000 miles of Earth between us and the other side of this globe that we're sitting on. There's stars beneath our feet right now. Unseen, of course, but no less real, no less present. And now in the daytime, if you look up and you see that light blue sky, the stars are still there above our heads, right where they were just before dawn. If we were in space, we could see the sun and the stars at the same time. Why? Because there's no atmosphere. As we sit here on the surface and look through the atmosphere, the sunlight comes down and the air molecules scatter the high frequencies, the blue light, and that makes the sky look blue and obscures what stands behind it. But if you got in a spacecraft and rose into orbit, that sky would get darker and darker and then fade to black and the stars would reappear. They're still there, above and below. What is seen and what is unseen, what is present or not, has as much to do with our own perspective with our own awareness, as pretty much anything else. To realize that something is still there, to tune in, is to start the process of being able to see again. And to really push this metaphor, like you know I love to do, when the sun of our own consciousness is up, it's so bright that it obscures the stars of the presence of everyone and everything around us. That's why in contemplation, what are we doing? We're setting the sun of our consciousness so that we can see the stars again. And we do that with those four S's, with silence and solitude and stillness and simplicity. That's what allows us to set the sun of that huge star of our consciousness that is just so glaring, so distracting, it obscures everything else. But moments like these that we've experienced with Bob, these moments of great loss, these moments of great love, these moments of great loss that prove that there was great love, are changing that, are doing the work for us, bringing us intuitively and quickly to what would take years of contemplative practice otherwise. Why do you think Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted? It's because the pain of loss proves the presence of love that was in the connection. If that love wasn't real, if that connection wasn't real, we wouldn't be feeling the pain of the loss that we feel right now. And by honoring that grief, by 
staying present to it, even when it's painful, takes us to a deeper sense of meaning. That's the comfort that Jesus is talking about. Not to lose connection in these painful times is to realize again that nothing is lost. It only changes form. But intense moments like these won't last. They can't last. They're going to fade back behind the blue sky as the sun of our consciousness rises again out of that intensity. It always does. Unless or until we keep practicing presence and not lose the ground that was covered by the intensity of this particular moment. How do you know if you're really present? Ever even thought about that? How do you know? if you're present to the moment that you're in. First of all, are you deeply aware of everything that is going on? Are you seeing it all? Are you watching it all pass by like frames of a movie? Whether they're painful or whether they're not, are you aware of them? And most importantly, are you grateful at the same time? Use your gratitude meter to test the quality of your presence. Because gratitude is what presence feels like. When we were completely immersed in a moment, when nothing else intrudes and we were just there, all the negative emotions leave us along with our son of our consciousness, the star that obscures everything else. And what's left in that place feels like gratitude. This moment, moments like these, missing Bob, but at the same time, very acutely aware of the gratitude that we have for the privilege of sharing our lives with his, of having his life sharing with us, and even grateful for the pain that we know that we will only feel because of the connection that we had, because of the love that we had. Now, often people will say something like, you know, Bob is present and alive in our hearts for as long as we remember him. Have you heard something like that before? Yeah, it's a lovely thought. But I think it misses the point that I'm trying to make. And I think it misses the reality that Jesus is trying to teach us. I'm convinced that our hearts, when they are tuned to presence, make us aware that Bob is still present that Bob is still alive, that he has merely changed form. We are becoming aware of something that is here and now. It's not just subjective. Do I know that for certain? Of course not. How could I? But moments like these have convinced me that it's important for me to live my life as if that is true. That's what faith is. It's living as if something I say I believe is true and ordering my actions and my choices around that belief, that conviction. And this changes the quality of now. This changes the quality of every lived moment, of moments like these. We can become convinced that endings are just new beginnings, that life and love and time are circles not lines, and always bring us back home again. I wanted to finish with uh, a journal entry that I wrote almost exactly 30 years ago. Marion and I were married only two months at the time, and uh, Marion was attending a weekend retreat uh, with our church, and so she left me with the two girls, one four and one eight, I had to face for an entire weekend the horrors of what Marion faced every single day. (laughs) But by Sunday morning, I got up early and I was writing in my journal before we went to church. And it was Sunday, May 22nd, 1994 at 6.20 a.m. That's how OCD I am. Two months married. Happy 60-day anniversary. From the great perspective of two months, I can't help wondering how many anniversaries there will be and how long before I can balance all the pieces of my new life. Life has begun again. Life is two months old. 
Life will never be the same again and again. Almost ready to turn off the desk lamp. Last brave little star fighting to be seen through the lightning blue between the upper branches. Cold morning, cold, dark apartment, very quiet. Little girls asleep in the other room. Just like the first entry here with you asleep, not 41 days old, but seven years old. A person. You are who you are. I know who that is. You'll reinforce it from here, modify it, but not fundamentally change. This is a good thing. You are a good person. The little star is gone now. Had to give up the fight against the big star coming up the other side of the sky, just starting to color the treetops. Light off. Cool blue cast over the pages now. So warm, knowing that you're here with me, sleeping peacefully. Trusting me supremely, to fully, to keep you safe. Allowing yourself through me to be a child. To defer growing up for a while longer because you can. Quarter to seven. Time to shower, time to shave, time to wake you as slowly and gently as possible. Time for stretching and dressing and donuts on the drive to church. Time for the noise to begin. The day to rise up, roll over us, grow old, fade to evening, to give us just enough time to gather enough strength to get up and watch the little star lose its fight once more in the coming glare. And just now, in my silence, looking for next words, feeling the weight of the emptiness of not knowing exactly what to say, feeling myself at the end of myself with nothing else to offer this page or anything or anyone else, I hear soft footsteps, bare footsteps in the carpet behind me, and I turn to you, stumbling toward me, eyes half closed, arms out. I gather you into my lap, warm, smooth, hold tight, whisper in your ear. Groggy whispers back. Don't you see? This is life. I hold it in my arms, precious, fleeting, unpredictable, untenable. It comes unbidden, stays as long as it desires, changes form without notice. When we think it's over, when we think there is nothing left, soft footsteps come up from behind and flow warmly into our laps and breathe new words into empty pens new thoughts into empty minds, new fire into cold hearts. The little star is not lost. It is still there, burning with the intensity of a thousand suns. It simply gave way for a time, a short time, to let us have day, warmth, variety, life. But it is still right there, between the branches, between someone's branches as this ball turns. You are like this, Lord, burning brightly beyond the light blue veil, giving way to our daylight for a time while we live. I keep forgetting that you are here, that the veil is much closer than the sky, that I am not all there is, that when I am over, your soft footsteps will come and bring new life and words, if only I will pull you into my lap and hold you as though my life depended on it. Oh, my God, my Lord, my life, thank you. Thank you for the tears on my cheeks. Thank you for my little girl sleeping again in my lap, for my littler one in the next room, and my bigger one away in the mountains. Thank you for this cold, clear morning, for the doves sitting in the top branches of the lightning trees. Thank you for my pen. Thank you for reminding me of my life. You are the unexpected, Lord. You are the ultimate surprise that keeps us guessing, interested, and alive. Let's pray. Father, we know that we are present to you and to each other because we are grateful for Bob's life. We are grateful for the friendship we are grateful for all of his mannerisms and eccentricities and his accent and everything that he gave us that filled us with smiles 
and just a sense of knowing that everything was okay when we were talking to Bob. That he really saw us. That he cared about us. That he made time for us. We're grateful for all of this, Lord. And now we turn our attention to the living and we want to surround Anne and Fiona and Thomas and Simon and everyone who will be affected by this in his family and for the rest of us as well who will be finding new meaning with this peace missing and then moving through that meaning to the sense that Bob's presence is still here, that he is still alive and still with us and we are still connected in this deep way that we can't prove, but we are becoming more and more convinced of. Thank you, Father. We are a grateful people, and for now, a present people. Thank you for Bob's life. Show us how to use that experience and friendship to make a better quality of now for ourselves and everyone we meet. And never let us forget, we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.